Okay, now we're going to move into Article 220. Article 220 is branch circuit feeders and service load calculations. Branch circuit feeder service and load calculations. Now we're going to start off on page 74. Page 74. Page 74, uh, middle of the left-hand column, just down below the graphic there, we've got Part 2, Branch Circuit Load Calculations. And then down below there, we've got 220.11, Floor Area. Floor Area. The floor area for each floor shall be calculated from the outside dimensions of the building, dwelling unit, or other area involved. For dwelling units, the calculated floor area shall not include open porches, garages, or unused or unfinished spaces, not adaptable for future use. So in this article, what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to do our dwelling unit calculations. And when we're doing those, one of the first pieces of information we need is the square footage of the uh, area that we're uh, calculating here. And so that's going to be basically just heated area. Any open porches, garages, or unused or unfinished spaces not adaptable for future use. Uh, say it was a basement and the ceiling heights weren't adequate to actually uh, adapt for future use, then we would not include that. So that piece of information is going to be really crucial there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through, we're going to learn the rules of this stuff. And then uh, what we're going to do from that point is we'll do some actual calculations using uh, the rules that we just learned. All right, so first thing is floor area. We're going to take that from the outside dimensions of the room or from the uh, building. Then on page 74, still same page, uh, middle of the right-hand column, we've got 220.14, other loads, all occupancies. And then we're going to move to the uh, next uh, section here, uh, to letter G, show windows. Letter G, show windows. So there'll be a question on the exam that talks about the show windows, and they'll have to calculate the load that we'll be responsible for on that, and that's going to be 200 volt amps per linear foot of show window area. So I have a 20 footer, then I'm going to take that 20 times 200, we're going to end up with 4,000 volt amps for a show window that's 20 feet wide. Uh, letter I underneath that same heading, it says, except as covered in uh, J and K, receptacle outlets shall be calculated at not less than 180 volt amps for each single or for each multiple receptacle on one yoke. So it says, hey, that doesn't apply to J or K. What's J? J's dwelling units. What about K? Banks or office buildings, right? So we don't uh, apply this 180 volt amps per outlet on, uh, on dwelling units or banks or office buildings, okay? So it says, uh, in one, in, under letter J, dwelling units, in one family dwellings and two family dwellings, and multifamily dwellings, the minimum load shall not be less than 3 volt amps per square foot. The lighting and receptacle outlets specified in 220.14 J1, J2, and J3 are included in the minimum un unit load. So they're saying, hey, even though that's called lighting load, we're going to include these receptacles as part of that, and it's all included in that 3 volt amps per square foot. It says, no additional load calculation shall be required for such outlet. And then number one says all of our general use receptacle outlets of uh, 20 amp rated or less, including receptacles connected to the circuits in 210.11 um, C3 and 210.11.C4. And then number two, the receptacle outlets specified in 210.52 E and G. Okay, so that's going to be like our garages and things and outdoor. And then also the lighting outlet specified in 210.70. So all of our lighting outlets, all of our receptacle outlets are all included in that 3 volt amps per square foot. Uh, page 76. Page 76. 76, top of the left-hand column, you got 220.18 maximum loads. And then we're going to go down to letter B down below there, inductive and LED lighting loads. For circuit supplying uh, lighting units that have ballasts, transformers, auto transformers, or LED drivers, the calculated load shall be based on the total ampere ratings of such units and not of the total watts of the lamps. Okay, so we're going to base that based off of the amps, uh, not based off of the volts. I'm uh, not based off the watts, sorry. And then under part three, feeder and service load calculations, now we're going to take that information that we learned in part two 
and apply that to part three here, uh, 220.43, show window and track lighting. It says for show window lighting, a load of not less than uh, 200 volt amps per linear foot shall be included for a show window measured horizontally along its base. We already learned that, it just kind of restated that in this calculations section. And then letter B, track lighting. It says for track lighting, in other than dwelling units or guest rooms or guest suites or hotels or motels, an additional load of 150 volt amps shall be included for every two feet of lighting track or fraction thereof. So if I had a 10 footer, we'd do that 150 volt amps times five, so we'd end up with 750 volt amps. Page 76, real important table. Page 76. We got this table here, this 220.42 lighting load demand factors. And basically, um, we're going to take this information and we're going to take our square footage and we're going to be able to do rate that based off of this. Both the square footage and then also our um, small appliance load and our laundry load can be derated based off of this table. It says lighting load demand factors, but when it comes to a dwelling unit, it includes the lighting and the general um, receptacle load as well, okay, which is all incorporated in that three volt amps per square foot. So for a dwelling unit, our first 3,000 volt amps, we'll do it 100%, and then from 3,001 to 120,000, we'll do that at 35%. So that is something that uh, we're going to work on. We're going to work through some problems. I'll show you how to do that stuff. Don't worry too much about it right now. Just know this is the table where we derate stuff. And then 220.50 on the same page, we've got uh, on page 76, we've got motors. It says motor load shall be calculated in accordance with 430.24, 430.25, and 430.26, and uh, with 440.6 for hermetic refrigerant motor compressors. So it says, hey, if you want to get the volt amps on that stuff, find that stuff out in the motors chapter and then bring that into our calculation. Page 77, top of the page, first thing on the page, you've got 220.51, fixed electric space heating. It says fixed electric space heating loads shall be calculated at 100% of the total connected load. So fixed electric space heating is going to be done at 100%. Okay, so we're just keeping these rules in mind. Uh, 220.52, we've got small appliance and laundry loads for dwelling units. Uh, letter A, small appliance circuit load. In each dwelling unit, the load shall be calculated at 1,500 volt amps for each two wire. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> for each two wire, small appliance branch circuit is covered in 210.11C1. Now, if you remember in 210.11C1, what we ended up having to do is use uh, a minimum of two small appliance branch circuits, right? So, it's saying now let's go ahead and sign a value to that of 1,500 volt amps per. All right, and then we're going to skip down a little bit. It says these loads shall be permitted to be included with the general lighting load and subjected to the demand factors provided in table 220.42. And then our laundry circuit load down below there, it says a load of not less than 1500 volt amps shall be included for each two wire laundry branch circuit um, as in covered in 210.11C2. This load shall be permitted to be included with the general lighting load and sub shall be subjected to the demand factors provided in table 220.42. So basically what they're saying there is, hey, remember back in 210.11C2, we had one laundry branch circuit, two small appliance and one laundry branch circuit. Let's assign a value of 1500 to each of those and then we're going to include that with the square footage and uh, subject that to the demand factors in table 220.42. All right, moving on, on page 77, we got 220.53, appliance loads for dwelling units. It shall be permissible to apply a demand factor of 75% to the nameplate rating of four or more appliances rated one quarter horsepower or greater, or 500 watts or greater, that are fastened in place and that are served by the same feeder or service in a one-family, two-family, or multifamily dwelling. This demand factor does not apply to Number one, household electric cooking equipment that is fastened in place. That's going to be handled by uh, table 220.55. Uh, clothes dryers, that's handled under 220.54. Our space heating equipment, which we talked about before, was at 100%. And 
And then air conditioning equipment is going to be at 100% as well. So we talked about electric clothes dryers real briefly there, but let's look at the rule on electric clothes dryers. This is on page 77. It says the load for household electric clothes dryers in a dwelling unit shall be either 5,000 watts, or you can call that volt amps, or the nameplate rating, whichever is larger, for each dryer served. The use of the demand factors in Table 220.54 shall be permitted. So Table 220.54 is if we have more than one um, household electric clothes dryer, what situation would we have where we have more than one? Well, that's going to be like multifamily, right? And so we'll use on a multifamily calculation, we'll use Table 220.54, okay? But other than that, I mean, even using Table 220.54, we've got to remember doing the standard method uh, dwelling unit calculation, the minimum for an electric clothes dryer is going to be 5,000 watts, okay? Uh, page 77, 220.60, we've got non-coincident loads. Now, a non-coincident load is a load that's not going to happen at the same time as another load, okay? So, for instance, air conditioning and heat, right? I'm never going to run the air conditioner and the heat at the same time, so what they're saying is, for these calculations, just figure out the bigger of the two, and uh, we'll go from there. But there is a little bit of a change to the code here, and it's listed down here at the bottom. So it says, where it's, un where it's unlikely that two or more non-coincident loads will be used simultaneously, it shall be permissible to use only the largest load that will be used at one time for calculating the total load of a feeder or service. And here's where things change up uh, for this code time cycle. It says, where a motor is part of the non-coincident load and is not the largest of the non-coincident loads, 125% of the motor load shall be used in calculation if it is the largest motor, okay? So basically what they're saying is if it's not the largest motor, we can just do 100% versus 100%. But if it is the largest motor, the only motor that they talk about, then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do 125%, and typically that's going to be on the air conditioning, versus 100% of the heating, and then we'll pick the larger of those two numbers, okay? I'll show you how that plays out as well. That's something, like I said, that's brand new. This table here on page 78, this is our table for household cooking equipment. Household cooking equipment. So the table title is Demand Factors and Loads for Household Electric Ranges, Wall-Mounted Ovens, Counter-Mounted Cooking Units, and Other Household Cooking Appliances, over 1 and 3 quarter kilowatts rating. And then it says Column C is to be used in all cases except as otherwise permitted in note number 3. So uh, we're going to actually teach you how to use columns A and B, but they're saying if you just want to use column C, you're fine with that, okay? So you got your number of appliances on the left-hand side. Column A is for those appliances that are less than 3.5 kilowatts rating. And then column B is for those appliances that are between 3.5 kilowatts through 8 and 3 quarter uh, kilowatts. And remember kilo, that means 1,000, right? So that's eight and three quarter thousand or eight thousand seven hundred and fifty watts and then column c is for over eight and three quarter kilowatts through 12 kilowatts but if we want to just use column c in all cases we could do that but the problem here is on the test they're asking us for the minimum okay so we can't just use column c in all cases if we can come up with a smaller number using columns A and B, we're going to use that because that's the minimum, okay? So note number one uh, says, hey, what if I've got a range that's over 12 kilowatts? What are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take our maximum demand in kilowatts, which is uh, our column C value, and we're going to increase that by 5% for each kilowatt that we have over 12 kilowatts. So if I had a... Uh, 13 kilowatt range, that's 1 kilowatt or 5% over what my column C value is, so I'd add 5% to column C, so I'd end up instead of 8,000 at 8,400. Now you notice column C is the maximum demand in kilowatts, but if I go over to column A and B, column A and B are actually percentages. You see that line that's going over that says demand factor percentage? That line only extends over columns A and B. 
So that uh, basically um, says that those are percentages. So when it says 80, it's not 80 kilowatts, it's 80% of the kilowatt rating of the appliance. And then down below there, um, note number three says over one and three quarter kilowatts through eight and three quarter ki three kilowatts. It says in lieu of using column C, you can do all your column A demand at that percentage, column all the column B demand at that percentage, and then add the two numbers together and compare that to column C and see which one's lower, and then go ahead and use that one. So again, on this test, we're looking for the worst possible job that we can do and still get away with it, right? And so the worst possible job may be using columns A and B in combination. So I'll teach you how to do that as well. All right, moving on, 220.61, we've got feeder or service neutral load and basic calculation. So good news, we haven't been seeing any neutral load calculations on the exam. So I'm not even going to teach you how to do that, but they do ask you something out of here, which is the percentage that we can apply to certain appliances, okay, for the neutral. Uh, letter A, basic calculation, the feeder or service neutral load shall be the maximum unbalance of the load determined by this article. The maximum unbalanced load shall be the maximum net calculated load between the neutral conductor and any, and, uh, any one ungrounded conductor. So we're going to use our unbalanced load. And then down below there, letter B, we have a permitted reduction, and this is typically what we're seeing on the exam. It says, a service or feeder supplying the following loads shall be permitted to have an additional demand factor of 70% applied to the amount in 220.61B1, or portion of the amount in uh, 220.61B2, determined by the following basic calculations. Number one, a feeder or service supplying household electric ranges, wall-mounted ovens, counter-mounted cooking units, and electric dryers where the maximum unbalanced load has been determined in accordance with table 220.55 for ranges and 220.54 for dryers. So they're saying, hey, what per percent reduction can we take on that equipment? And the answer would be 70%. All right, so let's take a look at these dwelling unit calculations. All right, so our dwelling unit calculation, first off, we've got to define what is a dwelling, right? So a dwelling is anything that has uh, an independent living facility with permanent provisions for living, sleeping, permanent facilities for cooking and sanitation, and for permanent facilities, cooking and sanitation, all right? So living, sleeping, cooking, and sanitation. So in this case, we got a bedroom, we got a couple of bedrooms there for sleeping, right? Sanitation, a bathroom, we got a place to cook, we got a place to hang out, the living room. So we've got living, sleeping, cooking, and sanitation. So that's a dwelling unit. There are two different methods that we can use to calculate um, our load calculations. One of them is called the optional method, and then the other is called the standard method. And which method you use depends on what they ask for on the exam. So you can't just say, oh, I'll just do this with an optional method, because frankly, the optional method is tons easier, right? So you can't just decide, I'm going to do everything with an optional calculation because that's not allowed. They're going to say, hey, I want you to do this using the standard method, or I want you to do this calculation using the optional method. So what we've looked at so far has been the standard method. So it says, following steps can be used to determine the demand load of the feeder or service conductors for a dwelling unit uh, contained in the standard method, which is part three, which is what we just looked at. Uh, letter A, it says, take your square footage and multiply by three volt amps per square foot. And then letter B, add two small appliance branch circuits at 1500 volt amps each and one laundry branch circuit at 1500 volt amps. And then letter C, we apply table 220.42. So if you need to pause the video, write down these uh, various different steps. It may be something you want to transfer into the back of your book. But Annex D actually shows you these various different steps on these dwelling unit calculations. And then step two, we're going to calculate the fixed appliance demand load. If I have less than four fixed appliances, we're going to calculate it at 100%. Okay. And if I have four or more, we're going to do that at 75%. That's based off of the information we highlighted in 220.53. 
And then remember on closed dryers, 5,000 is a minimum. So letter A says if less than 5,000 watts, use 5,000 watts. If greater than 5,000 watts, use the nameplate value. And then step four, we got to determine our load for our cooking equipment, and we'll use table 220.55, and we'll, we'll go through some examples, and I'll show you how to do that. And then step five, determine uh, the demand load for any additional loads. And typically, we're not seeing this on um, the Texas exam, but electric vehicle chargers, elevators, hydro massage bathtubs, RV circuits, welders. We calculate these and other miscellaneous loads at 100% of the nameplate value. And then step six, we determine the air conditioning load versus the heating demand load. So we may skip step five entirely. In fact, I think all of my examples skip uh, step five in its entirety. If the air conditioning is the largest motor load, we're going to calculate that at 125%. And again, that's new information on this code. Uh, letter B, we're going to calculate the heating load at the nameplate value. And then C, select the larger of the two calculations and omit the smaller of the two calculations. So we're only going to add the bigger of 125% of the air conditioning or 100% of the heat, okay? And then step seven, we're gonna add any additional motor loads. And again, if the, my largest motor load is part of the additional motor loads, we'll do that at 125%. But all of our other modes are gonna be, loads are gonna be, motors are gonna be calculated at 100%, okay? So it gets a little bit complicated there now. And then step eight, we add all of them together. Our lighting and receptacle load calculation that we derated, our uh, fixed appliance load, our clothes dryers, our cooking equipment, our miscellaneous loads, uh, the larger of the heating and the air conditioning, and any additional motor loads. So uh, for the most part, in my examples, we'll omit uh, step five and step seven um, because we're not gonna have any miscellaneous loads or additional motor loads, okay? So we're really going to do just one, two, three, four, and six.